What's up, everybody? It's the Junkyard Dogcast. I'm Jake Rowe with Dogs 24-7. With me, Kip Adams and Rusty Mansell, also of Dogs 24-7. We got some news top of the show today. Scott Cochran, uh, Kirby Smart comments on him and the SEC coaches teleconference. Good news there, positive news, news we wanted to hear, news that you like to hear. Uh, Georgia also got a commitment, 2023 cornerback K and Lee. I think I'm saying his name right there. If I'm not, Rusty will correct me here in just a minute. But Georgia gets a commitment from him. Four-star prospect, big-time cornerback, potentially a guy that that may even have a chance to rise up the rankings. Fitz Georgia's bill at the cornerback position. We're going to get into that. And then the second half's mailbag. We're going to answer your questions and, uh, and, and basically have our kind of fan involvement to show we are live on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed and left us a comment already, do that. Please do that. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, know every single time we fire one of these up, whether it's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, we've done a Friday, we do Saturday after the game. You don't want to miss out on any of it. We want you to be here. We want you to see what we got going on. And like I said last week, or sorry, last show, we're really just getting started. Uh, Kirby Smart today, let's jump right into it. Kirby Smart says, Scott Cochran, for the time being, for right now, is back in Athens, visiting with family. He's been around the team, and they're hoping to get him back in the next couple of weeks. Rusty, what was, you know, you may have known that already because we, I mean, you're Rusty, uh, but uh, we, uh, we, uh, <laughs> uh, if you didn't know that already, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? How, do you, how does that kind of uh, resonate with you? That's great news. I mean, you look at the human side of this, and a lot of times it goes on, you know, people just, day to day don't really con these guys seem like they're just larger than life sometimes as coaches and they're human beings under a lot of stress a lot of things going on i don't know specifically what scott Cochran is dealing with or what he dealt with uh but i know he was away for quite some time away from his family for several months so um, he was obviously getting some treatment and that's very good news to hear he's here with his family i know his son's a, a linebacker at uh one of the local middle schools there, and I saw some tape on him. I know, you know, that bloodline, he's going to be a pretty tough player as I look some of these eighth grade players that are coming up. And, um, you know, it's just good news, man. I know Kirby Smart is extremely tight with Scott Cocker. I know Kirby's wife is very tight with his wife. Their families are tight. So it's just good to have Scott Cochran back in any capacity. You know, that's things that that tells me things are going in the right direction. Look, I don't know uh, what the future holds for him, what he does at Georgia, where he's doing. All I know is from my from my point of view, it's the human side of it. And, and that's a great news that he's back in Athens, spending time around his family. Thought it was very interesting to say he spent some time around the team. So uh, that's good news for Scott Cochran. It's good news for Georgia. And, you know, we'll, we'll handle all those things. And that thing, you know, the, the situation of, you know, what does he do? What's his role and that type of thing? All that will be answered. You want Scott Cochran to be the best Scott Cochran. And, and obviously he went and got some help for himself. So, very, very good news to report that he's back in Athens, seeing his family and around the team some. Yeah, and that was the, seeing his family was the number one thing for True. me. Is you know knowing that they're away. Heck, I just want Scott Cochran to come back home. You know, I just want the yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, shoot, man, I was away from my family last weekend, and I was chomping at a bit to get back seeing my kids and my wife. So can't imagine what it's like being away for an extended period of time. Um, and you're right, Rusty, that, that whole role thing, the on-field thing, Will Muschamp, Scott Cochran, support staff, on-field staff, that'll all work itself out in due time. Yep. And, um, you know, I, but I mean, I don't, I don't envision it being this year. I don't envision him jumping right back in this year, but we'll see. We'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, that, that's Kip, when, when you kind of, I mean, it kind of popped up on us today, really. I mean, it was got asked at a, in a teleconference and Kirby responded to it. What, what were your immediate thoughts to hearing Scott Cochran was back in Athens, back around the team? Yeah. I mean, this, this is, uh, a quality of life thing. It's a human interest aspect first, and it's it's a sporting news second. So, you know, just happy that it seems to be that, you know, he's in a better place now, you know, than whatever he was in dealing with before. And the fact that he's back, the fact that he's in Athens means that, you know, whatever was needing to happen has happened and is happening. And that, you know, for Georgia, you know, I didn't really think anything of it because, I mean, they have Will Muschamp, you know, and they're they're in the season right now. Like this, once the season starts, it's kind of tunnel vision. I don't think that you know for for Scott Cochran, it's it he's outside of where Georgia's season is right now, where it's headed. So I don't think that 
what his role would be is is even something that is a worry at all for Kirby Smart and his coaching staff because, I mean, just like when they they had heading into the season, they had Will Muschamp on the support staff, you know, that so there's not really an, an issue there. If Scott Cochran comes back and, and is working again, if he's in the office, then he can fill, fall right into that role as you know an analyst, as a support staffer. He can help out in any way that he feels comfortable doing. I don't think you really ha- you, you don't mess with the the on the field coaching staff right now because I mean as of now you know nothing's broken everything's working fine the defense is playing really well special teams is you know getting better every week so you know from the football aspect of it i don't really think that you know it's something that they're really worried about they're just glad to have scott cochran back and or at least him him being back in athens and and getting to see his family and you know and just getting to a better place overall i mean that's all you can want for him and it, it, you know, him being back and being with his family is, is good for him. And, and overall, I mean, again, that's good for Georgia. If he does come back, great. If he doesn't come back this year, they have the guys already there in place to to get the job done. So I just think that it's not something that Scott Cocker needs to worry about. And I don't think it's something that Kirby Smart's worried about either. Yeah. And, you know, listen, as a guy that, that you know, has a reputation for having such a strong rapport with his players, I mean, a shot in the arm probably for some of them, for a lot of them to kind of get him back in the building and see his face, to see he's doing well. I'm sure they weren't like regularly getting updates or anything like that on him. Maybe they were. Heck, I don't know. Maybe he was Zooming with them from time to time for all I know. But to see him back in person, his presence and all of that, I mean, listen, he was one of the best at what he did at Alabama for a reason. And it probably wasn't because he had all these – groundbreaking ways of 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 training kids it was it had a lot more to do with his rapport and his motivational you know ability and and things of that nature and and you know having that back and and having those relationships kind of be able to resume i think is is probably as big a lift uh, then, you know, as big a, a big a lift as can be achieved in a situation like this. And just glad to see he's doing well, and I think all of us agree on that. Also doing well in the 2023 class is Georgia recruiting. Kay and Lee, uh, Cedar Grove, uh, cornerback, four-star prospect. Rusty, I know you're real high on this kid. Tell us a little bit about him. I uh, went down last year on a Thursday night. They played Westminster on a Thursday night, and, and they had all kind of, you know, prospects just loaded, Cedar Grove, obviously, and, uh, coach Patrick, who's now down at Crips County, was the head coach of Cedar Grove last year. And we're talking pregame and we're looking at this player, looking at that player. They were absolutely loaded last year with with guys all over the field, D1 guys. And he called, pulls me over there and he says, this is the next one. He goes, this is this DB is special. This this guy can play. And he was a sophomore at the time and, uh, you know, took some pictures of him. And I remember thinking, man, that kid has got long arms. And so then he comes out and plays for Hustle Link, you know, one of the best uh, – Seven on sevens in the country plays with those guys. Plays with Oscar Delp, Gunner Stockton. Played with all those guys uh, as a DB this year, and uh, just really grew on me. And and getting to know him, you know what type of kid he is. I, you know, he, he's just really polished, put together young man. And uh, so I go down a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, maybe on a Monday to see uh, CJ Madden. He was going to commit to Georgia the day the next day. I was going down to get a story on him. And just to watch him practice, he's got so many prospects. And, and Kayan pulls me to the side, and he goes, hey, I, I committed to Georgia last night. I said, oh, okay. And he said, um, probably put it out in about two weeks. And I said, okay, and just let me know when you're ready to put it out. And uh, I knew right then, uh, you know, I kind of told our members on the board, I said, look, Georgia, I mean, I, go, I would never blow a kid's story, but I told Georgia, you know, our, our board on the uh, junkyard, I said, look, this guy can play. Uh, Georgia got a good commit last night or recently, a silent commit, somebody I really, really like. And uh, it was Ken Lee, and he came public today. And, you know, that was an Ohio State deal. He, he visited Ohio State a couple of times. They were they were really in on him as well. So big deal there to get an in-state kid. He told me he told me on, on the phone the other night doing his story, he said, look, I'm going after Christian Miller. You know, that he's already got one Cedar Grove teammate and C.J. Madden committed. But those two guys are going to be in Christian Miller's ear, and he is a big-time major 22 D line target. Uh, George is definitely trying to get in on there to, to, to get him in this class. And sounds like behind the scenes, it's a George Ohio state battle too. So we'll see how it goes, but, but uh, having K and Lee is a great, great football player. Uh, just super long reach in a five ten frame. Really like what he brings to this class. Now, Kip, 
what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at Georgia defensive back 2022 class, couple commitments already looking for more. Now you're looking at Georgia 2023. And and listen, you got to kind of juxtapose that with what's going on right now at Georgia defensive backfield. A lot of talented players, a lot of really good players, but not enough of them because they're paper thin at so many different positions, cornerback, nickel, safety, they're thin. What is what is getting, you know, kind of getting some you – know, it's almost like Marquise Groves Killebrew in last year's class, kind of getting a, maybe a little bit of hay in the barn or at least opening the barn toward to some hay uh, or real early. What does this mean for, for kind of remedying that paper-thin secondary issue for Georgia? I mean, yeah, they're getting a guy that looks pretty versatile. I mean, he's not the biggest guy in the room, but, you know, he kind of reminds me a little bit of Javon Bullard. You know, a guy that's already played a lot of football for Georgia as a freshman. I got, you know, playing in there at star, but, you know, versatile enough to play cornerback as well. I think that kind of fits what, you know, what Kane can bring to the table as a guy that, you know, has great instincts, has good speed, still has room to grow. You know, he might not be done growing. He could get to Georgia and, and be six foot, you know, 195, pushing 200 pounds for all we know. But as of now, I mean, you know, versatile enough and good enough size to, to play in multiple positions in the secondary. He just has – looks like he has that motor. I and mean, uh, we talk about the the game he just had against Atlanta Carver where he had a couple picks and the one play where he just, you know, he comes up from behind and, and tackles the ball carrier before he's able to score a touchdown. And this kind of shows the kind of motor that he has, and, and it really, really, really – stands out when you add all that together and you look for you know what Kirby Smart's looking for in a secondary it just seems like you know he has exactly what gets you on the field early at, at Georgia and why a guy like Javon Bullard is has played ahead of some guys that maybe ranked higher came in with you know with with four or five stars in the secondary and I think it helps a lot just to, to have another Cedar Grove kid I mean obviously Georgia's recruiting Christian Miller hard but that's a program that puts out Big time D one recruits every single year has young guys on that roster that George is going to be recruiting over the next couple of years. So having guys in multiple recruiting classes committed to Georgia at Cedar Grove can really, really only help you know George's case. And that twenty twenty three class, I mean, it's starting to pick up some steam with the guys they have. I mean, you, you pair him together with a guy like Marcus Washington, you know, who also very, very athletic and and has outstanding instincts as well. I think uh, you're really, really starting to get some depth in that secondary. And and as we've said on this show a lot, I mean, we've talked about Georgia not having great depth in the secondary. I, I'm really looking at this 2022 class and now 2023 class. I think we'll be saying the opposite, you know, two years from now about this defense, how the back end has just got depth for days. So, I, you know, really like the pickup and really, really like where Georgia is in the 2023 cycle right now. I think – uh you know, over the summer, it's usually the time when uh, people start to get a little antsy in recruiting, and and now we're we're heading into October, and, and this is kind of the time where Kirby Smart starts to clean up. So, getting a, a head start in next year's class, I think we'll we'll be talking about this group. You know, a year from now as as being one of the best in the country, and it's it's already number two in the team class rankings right now. So that that's a pretty good start for Kirby Smart. Things change so quickly in in this whole thing because you went from 2019 and 2020, embarrassment of riches in the defensive backfield. Now Georgia's thin. They'll probably be adequate next year, super you know deep the next year, and thin again the next year. I mean, it's it can just happen so quickly with that transfer portal, um, and it can be remedied so quickly through that transfer portal, and uh, we'll be here to follow it for you. Let's take a break. And on the other side, we're going to do mailbag questions, both from the folks at the Dawes 24-7 Junkyard and our YouTube uh, commenters. All right, guys, let's get to these mailbag questions. And Mad Dog 
seven five four zero my eyesight is failing me my computer's a little bit far away from me and i think i said those numbers correctly uh how close is don blaylock to being able to play um listen it is it, this is a soft tissue injury at this point right rusty i mean this is a hamstring over a knee he's cleared from the knee he's ready to go from the knee uh, it, this is a hamstring issue. And to be honest with you, the fact that he didn't travel last week and the fact that he didn't, he hasn't played yet. I mean, I, th I think you may be looking until after the bye week. Um, I, I think would probably be safe, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, I obviously not ruling it out sooner, but I think this best chance may be for Florida, uh, after the bye week. What would you say, Rusty? Yeah. And what I've, what I was told is the brace, uh, you know, you run in that brace and it limits you a little bit. And, um, it, it kind of twins his hamstring a little bit coming back. So, you know, it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating for, for Dominique Blaylock, first and foremost, Dominique Blaylock. Uh, I know Georgia fans are they're dying to get him back as well uh, after that really, really good freshman year. So uh, I do think it's going to take a little bit of time. He may be able to get in some reps here and there, but uh, a, a hamstring injury, Jake, is like an oblique. The only thing you can do there is rest. I don't care what kind of treatment. You can speed it up a little bit, but that's the only thing you can handle it is rest. So uh, we'll see where he is as the week goes on. If he gets, in, if he doesn't get any reps this weekend, I'm with you, Jake. It might be Florida before you see Donnie Blaylock in meaningful minutes. You know, you, Russ, you mentioned that oblique. I asked Kirby just kind of get an update on JT Daniels down at the teleconference. Apparently, JT is now dealing with a little bit of a lat issue, which is, uh, from what I understand, very much near the oblique muscle. Um, you know, probably a compensatory type deal there. We're compensating one muscle for the other. Didn't sound too major, but would didn't want to not mention it on the podcast. So maybe we're burying the lead a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to mention that as well. Let's move on. Miller, sixteen twenty four. How long do you think Will Muschamp will stay in Athens? Kip, what you got? <laughs> All right, let's let's get our get let's get our speculation on here. Uh, I mean. Hey, as long as it's a job that he enjoys, you know, I, I think I think he's there. And obviously, you know, got the kids there. You know, uh, I think that Will Muschamp, I mean, you never say never because if an opportunity comes up that he can't say no to, you know, obviously he's, he's going to look at that. And, I mean, I think he's got a chance to, to be a defensive coordinator again in the future, you know, poss if it, it, will it be a Georgia? I mean – Kirby has a not an embarrassment of riches, but he's got a, such a talented staff, especially I mean on defense. You got guys that are gonna be in the running for coordinator and you know head coaching positions in the future. So it, it's it's always gonna be next man up for that staff, and that's what he wants. It he wants this to be a place where you know if you have a goal of being a coordinator or a head coach that you're able to achieve those dreams, whether it's at Georgia or somewhere else. So. I mean, with Dan Lanning, with Glenn Schumann, you know, those guys are, are young and still moving their, their way up the ranks. I don't think they've reached their peak yet. So there there are there is the potential for there to be spots open on the staff after the season. And, and even with, you know, Scott Cochran's departure or, you know, the potential was there for Will Muschamp to be needed as an on-the-field coach, you know, at, at the end of the season. So I, I think that he's – you know, as of now, the silly season hasn't started. You know, the coaching openings haven't really – there aren't a lot of them right now other than, you know, USC. I, I mean, Will Muschamp's on the staff next year as of now because, I mean, there's not an opening for us to be really discussing with him that, that fits what he's looking for. But, I mean, his his agent's going to be taking calls and, and letting Will know if there's anything available all the time. So – Ask us that question again in January, and we'll probably be able to give you a better answer because right now he's focused on this season and trying to help Georgia. But, I mean, he's happy where he's at. So when you're happy where you're at, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult to see Will Muschamp being somewhere else next year because he just seems really content out there and, you know, he's doing what he loves. So I like Will Muschamp to be here next year. Uh, ask us again in January. Chime in, Rusty. What you got, man? If Will Muschamp's going to be here, how long? Let me give you two words. Witt Muschamp is a 2024 quarterback at Athens Academy. So, um, he, Will Muschamp just bought a pretty large house, you know, somewhere in Oconee County. So, now he could be given an opportunity that would, 
just blow them away and, and leave. But Will Muschamp's been there and done that. And Will Muschamp's got one of those three comma bank accounts. Uh, it's, it's, it's large. So he's got a place, he, he's got a place where, um, he's got a place where his son likes, uh, he's got one son that's at university of Georgia. Uh, this is where he graduated. This is where he played, uh, coaching with one of his best friends. So it's going to take something pretty, pretty special. I think to drag, you know, Will Muschamp away from Athens right now. Uh, I think he's locked in here for a couple of years until, um, you know, maybe something else pops up, but, you know, he's at a place where his son's playing and everything I hear is a really, really talented 2024 quarterback. Uh, he had a broken collarbone to start the season. He just came back this week over at Athens Academy. So uh, I think Will Muschamp's here for, for, for pretty good bit myself. Rusty, now listen, I, I didn't want to interrupt you while you're talking there, but are you trying to tell us that Will Muschamp is a billionaire? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Those numbers. I, I, listen, I may be wrong here, okay, but I think I think hey, three commas is a billion dollars. Now listen, I went to public high school. Will must you let me hold time. a dollar, okay? I, I know what, you know, I actually I, played against Will. So three commas, two commas, hell, it's a lot when you're talking about multiple commas. Let's hey, listen, I can't spend it with two commas, probably. So <laughs> he's um, got a lot of change, I can tell you that. And I can't his investment advice. I need to I need to get some of his tips. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. He uh, he, he went he went to Vegas. He went to Vegas and put that South Carolina buyout on red a few times. And I'll tell you what, I'll make this clock clear. Will Muschamp will never worry about a power bill the rest of his life. <laughs> does, that, does that make it better? Yeah, there you go. Or a phone bill. I, no, you just yeah. said you said three commas and my my head started spinning and I was like a billion dollars. No, right. I mean I know he doesn't and and you know I don't know. I, I kind of lost track over there too. I just hey. thought it was funny. Three two. Um, it's all the same. It's a lot. It's a lot different tax bracket. It's more than one. <laughs> I'd like to have one comma in my bank account right now. That'd be great. That'd be real good. All right. Uh, what's the biggest challenge this week? This comes from BGB Dog. What's the biggest challenge this week for UGA versus Arkansas? I'm going to go ahead and say I think Traylon Burks is a big deal um, in this game. He kind of lit Georgia up last year. But one thing I want to point out, and and uh, I won't save this for for tomorrow when we do predictions. I've noticed this trend that Georgia's, Georgia will make somebody else beat them. And, and uh, you have a recent example of that, and that's South Carolina. Now, listen, South Carolina didn't even come close to beating Georgia last year in 2020. But Nick Muse had a big game, and all of a sudden Nick Muse did nothing in this year's game, and they made Josh Van kind of be the guy that, that made big plays on him. I think that Georgia will probably try and do something like that. But, listen, Traylon Burks is a dude. He's a big-time player. He lines up all over the place, as Kirby Smart pointed out yesterday. I've noticed that the closer he lines up to the mix there, to the offensive line, the more likely he is to get the football. They find ways to get him the ball and to find mismatches. You're not going to chase him around the field with Darian Kendrick or, or Keely Ringo or somebody like that. You're going to have to find him and get him covered through different guys. And I think that's a big issue. And Kendall Browse knows how to use guys like that. He's a good offensive mind. I think that's, you know, kind of spot number one you have to really look at. Rusty, what would be your take on that, the, the biggest challenge for Georgia this weekend? Georgia's got to run the football. I mean, Georgia's got to run the football. You go back and look what they did to Ole Miss last year, and they absolutely just tore Ole Miss up. And Lane Kiffin was – in my opinion, hard-headed and wouldn't run the football, and they threw th six interceptions. So you you, you got to be able to loosen them up a little bit because they want you to check down everything. They want you to throw everything underneath. They're going to run to the football. They're sitting there with a three-man look. They're daring you to run the football. Now, is Georgia going to come back and go, we're going to run the ball, and you're going to have to bring an extra guy in the box because if you allow them to keep that five-man box, those three-down – Lyman and those two backers in that tackle box, that's playing into exactly what Barry Odom wants you to do. Throw everything, check down. Uh, you know, we're going to run to the tackle. We're going to tackle that back in the flat. Now, James Cook's a little bit more athletic than some of the guys they played in space. So, you know, their backers going to be challenged as well. But I think if Georgia can run the football and they prove that early that they can run, it disrupts the whole the game plan for Arkansas and what Barry Odom likes to do. You look how teams play Ole Miss, and I guarantee you this, Alabama's going to do a lot of it this week. Barry Odom, after what he did to them last year, 
So that kind of was a blueprint for some things, uh, how to play that team. And I'm sure Lane Kiffin's adjusted. He's a hell of a play caller, so he's adjusted as well. But I can tell you, in my opinion, Barry Odom is going to sit back. They're going to drop seven guys when they can, and they want JT Daniels to throw everything underneath, and they want you to dink and dunk. And when you get down there in that 20 or 30, they're going to tighten things down when those windows get smaller and see what you can do. But they got a really good nose guard. This Ridgeway guy from Illinois State was a huge deal for them because it allows them to play that three down front. Uh, and he's not Jordan Davis, but he plays the same capacity to where you have to double team this guy a lot, eats up blockers, allows those linebackers to run. Bottom line, simple answer for me, if Georgia can run the ball, they can win this game going away, in my opinion. But if they can't run the ball, this thing's going to be very, very interesting. Challenge number one, Kip, what you got? JT Daniels being patient and be allowed to be patient. I mean, I I, I think Rusty's right. Georgia's going to have to be able to run the ball because of, of this defensive scheme. They're going to they're going to tell JT Daniels, listen, uh, you're going to have to sit back there and make good decisions, especially when you get in that red zone. You know, we're we're not going to let you beat us deep, and, and so you're going to have to be able to make the smart decision. Maybe not the big one, you know, you can't, everything's not going to be over the top. It can't be like, you know, like UAB or like Vanderbilt where you just see the guy, you know, a broken coverage and he got a guy running free and you, you can hit him right, you know, immediately. He's going to have to be able to sit back there. And again, the offensive line is going to have to allow him to sit back there and, and not have a guy in his face. Even if, you know, even if it's only three men up there, they have to give him, you know, four, maybe five seconds to make the right call, whether that's throw the ball out of bounds, you know, or, or you know, t just take a sack. He's got to be able to not turn the football over. So I, I think the challenge there is for JT to maybe, again, be patient and, and not try to force the ball anywhere because, you know, a couple turnovers early in this game and, and now you're starting to force it. Now, you know, you, you get into panic mode a little bit. So, yeah, if they're able to run the ball, it's going to make life a lot easier for him. And, and I mean, again, Arkansas's defense is set up to where this should be a big ground game for Georgia. But in this scenario, it's not. It's it's for JT Daniels to, to make the smart decisions early and often so that they can go ahead and get into that red zone and and, and try to figure it out there. I mean, find, find, use their tight ends, you know, whether it's Darnell Washington, whether it's Brock Bowers whether you got A.D. Mitchell, you know, use that size to your advantage once you get in there and, and again, use those running backs. So it, it's kind of multiple spots there. I think JD, JT Daniels being patient is number one because, you know, I just think that he's going to see coverages that he hasn't seen this year. And so, you know, seeing different things. We've been waiting for teams to, to kind of play, uh, you know, play Georgia uh, over the, in the air. And I think this is that scheme that's set up perfectly to do that. Now, granted, we all say that they're going to come out some, for some reason and, and throw eight in the box like every other team has this year. If they do something like that, then, you know, I think I think it's going to be a, another good day for JT. But I think this is just going to test them. It's a different look for him and it's a different look for Georgia offensively. So we want to see how they react to that. Sorry, I had a hard time getting the mute button fixed there. Uh, I think, absolutely. I'll tell you about one last comment on that. I like Kenny McIntosh and James Cook in space versus their backers. I know those kids play hard, yeah. but, you know, if I'm Barry Odom, that's what worries me too. You got to run to the football, and Kenny McIntosh can break tackles, and James Cook can glide, uh, make you miss in space. So that's, from the Georgia perspective, playing that way, trying to get everything funnel underneath, that would give me worries if I'm Arkansas. Can we get these guys down to the ground in space? Yeah, and and listen, Arkansas linebackers are good, but Every running guy. backs on on linebackers is most of the time a mismatch. Yep. And uh, you know, Arkansas has got Grant Morgan and Hayden Henry and 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 Bumper Pool, and those guys are really good players. But but Georgia does have you know, running backs are going to have the advantage most of the time, and and that's an area where Georgia should be able to get. And then, not to mention Brock Bowers maybe getting mashed up on one of those guys, which is going to have to happen at some point. Um, but but I guess that's also a reason why Arkansas is so zone heavy. And I'm really just interested to see if Barry Odom tries to, like Kip brought up, just throw something completely different. Um, because if that happens, then, you know, if they come at him from another angle, then there will be an adjustment period. And Arkansas has yet to give up a point in the first quarter this year. 
So uh, third win of beating teams, 34 to nothing through four games in the first quarter. So that's something I'm keeping my eye on as well. Uh, last one from the from the junkyard, Nash Dog 18 says, how many snaps do Ty Key and Darnell play this Saturday? Listen, I think Darnell probably play a handful of snaps, maybe a handful of situations, a half dozen to ten maybe. Um, I see I, – I'm not sure what to expect out of Tyke Smith, to be honest with you. I don't know where he's going to fit in terms of uh, in, in terms of where they're going to need him to play snaps uh, this Saturday. Rusty, you got an opinion on that? Not really. I mean, it's we'll, we'll learn more. I don't expect them to be a major part in this game. I really don't. And I know people get – excited but I've, I've said it before there's a difference in coming back to practice and there's a difference in being in football shape and the only way you get in football shape is to strap those pads on and go through 30 period practices and those types of things and get ready they certainly could bring darnell washington on a goal line package and those types of things uh they could go that 12 personnel we talk about maybe even some 13 personnel uh that type of deal but um don't get frustrated with those guys georgia fans if you don't see them this week it takes a little bit of time uh, but I do think when it's all said and done, both of these guys play a big part of Georgia and how far they go this year. But I just don't see it this weekend. I don't see a lot of plays out either right now. All right, we've got one more question to answer. It's from the it's the, it's the really only mailbag question we got from the YouTube commenters today from Brian Bivens. Who is out there that we can get Georgia? Who is out there that Georgia can get that could potentially replace Jordan Davis? I mean, that's a hard question for sure. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I'm not the recruiting guru, but I say Barry Alexander, maybe. Uh, but listen, you're talking about cut from a different cloth. Jordan Davis is going to be tough to do that in general. So, uh, I'll say anything, I'll say you guys add anything? I'll say this real quick before Kev answers. Uh, I mean, Barry Alexander is obviously a guy. Walter Nolan's a guy that George is still involved with. Those two guys, I think Kip would agree. But, you know, like it or not, George has been trying to replace Roquan Smith now for a couple of years, and there are just not many of those guys. And they got outstanding linebackers. But this is a guy that won the top 10. Jordan Davis, you better enjoy watching every single snap he plays at Georgia because it's just hard to find those. And those are once in a four or five year type dudes. You want you don't want to put that on somebody like Bear Alexander or Walter Nolan to come in and replace him immediately. This is a large human being. This guy can run. This doesn't happen very often. And he is an absolute perfect fit to what Georgia wants at nose guard. And those are hard to find. They'll have some really, really good football players. But to come in and say somebody's going to have that type of impact this early, it's hard to do. Kip, uh, listen, we do these social media drops and we do these sound bites. Give us one right here. Declare who will be the next Jordan Davis. I'm listening. Uh, I mean, who, we better check that transfer portal because I don't. There, there's not one. I mean, it kind of felt the similar way whenever John Atkins, you know, whenever he was out there, it was just that those guys are not easy to find. And I mean, George has gotten good looks out of uh, you know Zion Logue when he's been out there, and he's a guy that shows a lot of promise. But he, I mean, even when you see the photos of Bear Alexander, you know, next to Jordan Davis, it's a reminder that you know Jordan Davis is is different. I mean, you, you look at this defensive line class, you look at a guy like Travis Shaw, that was probably the guy for me that was the, kind of the closest to Bear Alexander in this cycle, just athletically and, and size-wise what he brings to the table. And they weren't able to get him out of the state of North Carolina. Even, you know, even with a guy like Jordan Davis, front and center of this defense, uh, the, you know, the Tar Heels, Mac Brown, they were able to, to keep him home. So, I mean, it's just a reminder of how rare a player like that is and, I mean, but I, I, if you want, I guess, uh, you know, a positive for this is that, you know, when Jordan Davis committed, it wasn't seen as as being the future focal point of Georgia's defense. So, I mean, there there's a chance there's a guy out there this cycle that maybe is getting slept on a little bit. You know, maybe maybe somebody like, you know, Tyre West, you know, maybe maybe Ty, uh, you know, has some physical development at the next level. Christian Miller, a guy at Cedar Grove, like we just mentioned, George is recruiting that high school hard. I mean, he he's his body is continuing to fill out, and, and he, you know he's a completely different looking player than he was this time last year. Maybe he continues to physically develop. You know, Georgia would love to have him in the class, and seems like they have some momentum there with him right now. So that's the only thing I say is that Jordan Davis wasn't Jordan Davis when he committed. So you just continue to evaluate. 
And one thing Kirby Smart's done the last couple of years is, is grab some guys that were not headliners of the class and and get you know get in, instant impact out of a lot of these guys, whether it's Lab McConkey, Jordan Davis, you know, A.D. Mitchell. They're getting guys that, that we weren't having podcasts about when they committed, but now we're talking about on a weekly basis. So that, that's the only thing I could help to that, the knowing that as of right now, we don't know another Jordan Davis out there. But, I mean, credit to Kirby Smart and his staff for, for the eval on that one. And, and I think Trey Scott is, is uh, you know, being seen a lot differently right now uh, than he was a year or two ago as far as both recruiting and development. Last question, Alvin Todd asked, is Cedar Groves old coach on Arkansas staff? Jimmy Smith, yes, he is the old coach. Yeah, two coaches yeah. ago, but we all know Jimmy. We all went down there. Great guy, doing a tremendous job as a running back coach. Um, and, and he's done that that number zero, that, that 10, 300-meter uh, freshman running back that Arkansas got is the real deal. And he came because of Jimmy Smith. So uh, it is Jimmy Smith, but he was two coaches ago. He's been gone, what, three or four years now. But we all know him, good guy. And, just another Georgia connection on that staff. Yeah, dude, bounce off the wall. A lot of energy. A lot, a lot of energy in that dude. Um, mm-hmm. One, there was one more question that I that I did think we could kind of I could you know kind of knock out real quick before we go. Chris Phillips from our YouTube crowd says, "Where has Georgia been most successful with Barry Odom's defense?" Listen, uh, they weren't successful. I, I think in 2015 at all. That was a nine six game. Uh, so you know, not a lot of success then. But since then, um, it's pretty much been through the air. You look at 2016, Jacob Eason kind of carved them up. 2017, Jake Fromm kind of carved them up. 2018, Jake Fromm kind of carved them up. Um, so it's it's mainly been it's mainly been a, uh, a a you know through the air type deal. Georgia has lit them up with the passing game, and George Pickens has had big games against Barry Odom defenses in the past. Uh, and but but obviously Georgia will be without him this Saturday. Listen, we're going to be back with you tomorrow. We're going to break this game down. It's a big one. Game day is going to be there, and we're going to have it covered. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, though. Subscribe to us. Leave us a comment. Let us know where you're from, You know what your ties to Georgia are. We want to hear all of it. We read through them, and uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow to make predictions. But for this episode of the Junkyard Dogcast, I'm Jake Rowe with Dogs 24-7. They're Kip Adams and Rusty Mansell from the same place. And y'all take it easy. <laughs>